Hello and welcome to another Alternate Media Live. Um, we've got something pretty special for you guys tonight, but before we get into that, a quick shout out to all of our Talmudim and Scholar, our top tier patron supporters. We really <laughs> couldn't do what we do here without you guys. We love you guys so much. Um, as usual, we begin the episode uh, with our friend in, in, in spirit. Um, but before that, we have another friend on the panel today. Uh, welcome, everyone, please. Robert from Saints and Sages. Um, I've really been looking forward to this conversation. Uh, this is one we mentioned in a TikTok Live uh, some time ago. Um, and it, it's just, it's been needing to happen. And now it's finally happening. And I'm stoked about it. So... I know I'm I'm still working on my Angel's Envy. Seamus, what do you have with you tonight? I am still kind of moving around, so I'm just uh, chilling with a summer ale tonight. Uh, but I do actually have whiskey. It's in a box, but it's close by, and I may switch at some point in the night. <laughs> nice. And then my friend Robert. Oh, what man. We have I, I got something special, so... Uh, those of you guys that kind of like popped into some of the lives, I've talked about it a bit. You know, our, our family, like or the wife and I's dream is actually to do our own cidery. Um, of course, being a history guy and, you know, going through the university and stuff, I ended up doing um, a history on apple cider in America. Um, and I came across this brand, which is called Layard's um, Applejack. So it's, it's a really... Um, uh, interesting drink when it comes down to it. I mean, it's it, it's in this category of like an apple brandy. Um, now, awesome. it was discovered partially by accident. What happens was they would go press all their 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 cider and let it ferment. But what would happen is like they would get a huge snowstorm, a big freeze, and it ended up freezing the cider. And so they ended up taking out all of the ice off of that, and it would leave pretty much Applejack. But this interesting brand is, is um, um, goes back like they, they claim it goes back into like the 1680s, like colonial period. Um, and they um, they talk about how um, there was a man, you know, later on in like uh, 1760, I think it was, um, who discovered their stuff and requested that they send, you know, a, a number of cases to his estate. Um, man ended up becoming the first president of the United States, George Washington. So, I mean, it's, it's nice. It's, it's so <laughs> that's awesome. history and, and American culture. Um, so anyways, that's what I'm drinking. An apple Jack. Um, I, I highly recommend if you have to try, try this. Mm. Yeah. I guess I got to switch to a liquor tonight. Now I'm the only one with a, with a barley based si system here. So. <laughs> hey, I, I brought my backup beer in case I was going <laughs> to. <so. laughs> right. See the man came prepared. He knows what we do here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, so our subject tonight, Seamus, introduce it for us. Okay, uh, fine. <laughs> no, uh, tonight's subject is an interesting one. So um, some of our, our viewership may be familiar with a uh, – it's a term in Hebrew. It's called tikkun olam, olam. Excuse me. Tikkun olam, and it means in Hebrew <laughs> to repair the world or to rebuild, to repair. Um, repairing the world. And – it's a concept. It's a philosophy that is central to um, particularly like modern orthodoxy and um, more, more appropriately ancient first century, uh, the sages Judaism, right? And we say the sages because any, any of the rabbis quote unquote that lived during the second temple period were actually called sages. Um, so, and, and I, I think it's Hillel that kind of sort of comes up with the concept or at, at the very least fleshes out the concept historically, whether or not it predates him, uh, we're unsure, but, uh, but we do know that he does mention it. And, uh, so this philosophy, um, and, uh, I'm, I'm using philosophy specifically cause it's more or less what it is, but also our friend here is a philosopher down, down here. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> so it's 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 a uh, well you're more of a i'm more of a historian not a philosopher um so I'm, I I'm exactly where i should be i'm right in between both of you here so. <laughs> see the balance 
as everything should be. Um, and so we're going to go over tonight. I hope so. Anyway, I'm going to, I'm largely going to let the two of you guys take the reins. Cause I'm not much of a philosopher. I'll be honest. Um, but Brad very much is. And so is my man here. So, uh, um, but essentially, I guess the question is, first of all, what is it? What is the concept? What is the philosophy? And secondly, who cares? You know, what, what does this mean for us? Uh, does this have any sort of impact on the um, lifestyle of a believer? Uh, so with that introduction, I release the reins to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I did a lot of... Uh, research in just the past two days um and a, a lot of a lot of what you're going to find when studying this subject is is going to seem redundant um and and that's given some of the the minor intricacies in in small details that make it different as it pertains to different circumstances um but uh so you know tikkun olam or or in the words of the vice president tikkun <laughs> 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 oh, I forgot she did invoke the. Uh, I forgot she tried to do that. <laughs> did you? Did you? Because I can't. I heard it once, and it just it's it it hasn't left me. <laughs> yeah, I totally forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so you know what is it? Rebuilding the world. What does what does that mean? Um, and it, it's interesting. One thing you'll find is that the the Jewish belief in particular is that when God completed the creation, right, the seven day creation, um, it, it was good. It was perfect, but, uh, not, not complete in the sense that there was no room for improvement, right? God left room for improvement. That's, that's the whole purpose and the idea of, of, of Adam dwelling in the garden, uh, so that he could tend the garden so that he could keep the garden right there there was something there for him to do and it was it was to to work and and build and help to grow and cultivate you know to to expand on what god had already created that's that was the idea um so in in as much as as it it does mean to rebuild the world. It also actually can mean to improve the world. And mm -hmm. really those, those two are not so different. Um, if, if you're, if you're rebuilding the world, you are improving it. We, we live in a broken world. Um, so naturally any, any attempt to rebuild what's broken is going to be something that is an improvement, but like, how do we do this? What does that look like? And I think I'm, 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 I'm very excited to hear uh, Robert's thoughts on this. Yeah, it's um, yeah, and that that's kind of where where my mind's been. And uh, I I came across this term a few years back, and um, you know, as I've you know studying history and started to look into you know um, the early early Christianity, and of course, you know, all of the things regarding Judaism. And, you know, I've been doing crazy history, so you know, spending some time studying Islam as well. Um, <clears throat> But anyways, this this term would arise every now and again, and um, I believe it has its like roots in um, a prayer. Um, the uh, and if if I recall correctly, I think it's like the the Elenu prayer. Um, That's it. Yep. <clears throat> um, yeah, and the uh, it, it's it's an interesting phrase because we don't really see this phrase, as far as I'm aware, within. Um, the canon, right? We, we don't see it, uh, but but the idea behind it is throughout the whole of Scripture. Um, you know, we we see this in um, um, this this idea of actually I've, I've heard it put as, as not just repairing. Uh, I've also heard it per, put as um, um, to improve. Um, but I, I like somebody had used it as, as to say rest the restoration of the world, um, mm, I like we, that which way. I think is 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 a brilliant way to think about it um <clears throat> there was this there when i was uh doing work, working in design and, and and staging um there was a um interior design group that that was coming out and becoming really popular called uh restoration hardware um and they just made they would take pretty much all of this old uh cabinetry wood um bar you know recycled barn wood and all that stuff um 
and would just um, rework them all into like just these gorgeous pieces of furniture. Um, and it's like, you know, the, these things that had so much character and so much story in them already and then created into something that has, you know, just as much story and, and just as much utility along with that. Like, uh, um, and so that's kind of like been what has framed my mind of thought when it comes to this idea of restoration. Um, and I feel like for the most part, that's exactly where we are in Christianity, right? We've, we've had this, this world that God has created um, for him and us to enjoy, right? I mean, all, all things to the glory of God. Um, but then we reach this point where, where we have this, this falling away, this, this, this divide, this chasm. I mean, however, it's been phrased over, you know, the, the millennia. Um, <clears throat> and God's purpose pretty much throughout scriptures is that kind of gathering and restoration, right? That, that is to bring things back together, to make them new, to make them better, to, to, to bring things um, together. And, and I mean, that, that is almost in that pattern of creation, as, as well as like all that we see unfolding throughout the scriptures. It's even the work of Messiah. So there's so much that falls into this umbrella, falls into this world. Um, and of course, I'm sure we'll get into some of this other stuff that we've talked about in other lives. Um, but what does that look like for us as Christians? Like, how, how do, is this something that God does separate from us? Or is it something that we kind of partake in? Um, well, and I, so I think, you know, the way that the way that we here at alternate media in particular would would take a view on this and Seamus, correct me if I'm wrong, right, is is one that I think the most of Christianity would agree with. Right. Because this is this is a physical world um, and God being a, a, a spiritual being, right, a, a non-physical entity, um, he he seeks to effect change in the world through us right through 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 those who serve and follow him and and so you know what what does that look like how 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 do we allow god to rebuild the world through us one of the one of the primary one of the primary um definitions given uh is particularly with instances of injustice right that's one of the that's one of the broader reasons that you'll you'll find or one of one of the broader um associations with tikkun olam is to uh to seek to right wrongs um in terms of justice and and even this even goes towards social justice you know uh that that that's a big part um but even that has to be done soberly you know you, you the pursuit of justice uh, unfortunately, because we are human, uh, can ignite a flame that uh, will will burn very, very brightly and can come to a point of actually harming the cause more than helping it. Um, so it there there there's a sobriety that's required to actually achieve this rebuilding in the most efficient way. You know, um, we can't we can't necessarily let our passion uh, against the injustice uh, overcome our better reasoning, because at that point we may end up doing injustice to someone else, and so it's it's like a fine line to walk, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, that that idea I think is is extremely important. And again, there is just so much that kind of fits underneath this umbrella, this uh, this term. <laughs> Um, and justice is definitely a great place to start. I mean, you think about it, I mean, justice is, you know, often depicted in our culture as, you know, lady justice with the blindfold, the sword and, and the balance in hand. And of course, that, that is to, uh, to be a depiction of how we would want justice to function. Um, the, the interesting, uh, there's, <laughs> I, I feel like I always have the tendency to just go on forever. But anyways, uh, I'll try to keep it short. Um, that, that, that idea of the balance, right? I mean, that, that is pretty much that, that, that is the depiction of what justice is. That is to say that when something becomes unbalanced, um, something needs to be done in order to restore that balance. Um, and of course, um, 
what is our biblical guiding principle for the law of justice? It's eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, right? Right. That is that these things are to remain equal. Now, there's also the sense of like, you can't go too far in this, right? Otherwise, you can create this, this cycle of vengeance, right? You know, this man killed my brother and then he sought out justice and I and he killed um, him. And now I'm going to go after that guy. Um, so um, what, what do we do with that? When, when is enough enough? Um, which is why the vital part of justice is mercy. At, at some point, we have to learn to let things go. Um, and otherwise, we all will be crushed under the weight of justice. Um, I was going to say, I think I think a, a large part too is uh, the the sobriety of self examination, right? Um, and and that's that's also part of Tikkun Olam, right? Uh, Tikkun Olam, rebuilding the world. Uh, one of the best places to actually start is in rebuilding the self, right? Rebuilding yourself, and this is where you know, in as much as social justice is certainly a noble endeavor, um, right. but this is where yeah. kind of where where Jordan Peterson takes his ideas regarding, you know, guy. I get it. He's the clean your room guy. But what he's trying to bring to bear to people is that, you know, it's one thing to uh, have the sense of nobility to worry about big problems that are well out of your control. Right. It's another thing to stop, self-examine and figure out what changes and what ways you can rebuild yourself because that is what is the most in your control, right? You can make the world a little bit of a better place by making yourself a little bit of a better person, right? And you will affect change that way, and it's the most <clears throat> at hand. Like, it, it is within your grasp directly to do that right now, you so know? If I could, if I could step in, if you don't mind. Uh, I actually want to say something because <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, um, I, I try to take these concepts and put a really simple uh, kind of summary, at least for the concept, and then everything else can kind of fall into place. And the one thing I kind of wanted to mention here is that really the heart and the essence of Tikkun Olam is, if you can picture this with me in the audience, it's pulling heaven down to earth. It's when when you when you do these things that are godly you bring the heavenly spiritual otherworldly things you bring that down around you around the space around you an example like on the spiritual example is like this office um you know if i if i if i pray in this office this office space becomes a little bubble of heaven right it's it's kind of you bring the world down with you um when you say a blessing over uh everyday products uh, but you thank God for it. You've 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 brought a little bit of heaven down with you, and and it's these little things like that that are the repairing of the world. It's the true essence is to take the world, the everyday mundane things that are around, mundane things that are around you, and bring heaven down. <laughs> what I love about what you just said, and I've got I've got notes on this because I think it's paramount and important to the discussion of Tikkun Olam to at least understand or have a, have a grasp on on uh, the klipa noga right <laughs> uh, the, the 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 klipas um, and and the the sitra akra right so so the the klipas is is uh, it's it's a shell a peel right um, it's 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 that which makes things mundane because what you've just described right is you've got a mundane item right and this this is this is klipas noga specifically right because you have the the absolutely unholy klipas that which cannot literally literally cannot be elevated beyond its status um because it was created for unholiness right it, it was created for its status uh but not everything is that way and so you have things you know common everyday items that we can say a bracha over um, and, and, you know, you, you can, you can, you can bless it and, uh, use it to enjoy, 
um, you know, Shabbat or something like that. You you have elevated the item by using it for a purpose holier than that which it was created for, right? This is part of what Tikkun Olam is. This is part of rebuilding the world is to elevate the everyday items around you to, you know, to to bring them to a higher status of holiness by using them uh, for the sake of heaven, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, but, and it's not just the items as well. It's also the space, right? Right. When, uh, for things that when you do things that can't involve an item, right? Like give charity, uh, which I guess involves money, but you know, um, specifically, yeah. I'll pull it up on the banner. Uh, the the master said something in the model prayer uh, that is the essence of Tikkun Olam. Yeah. Yeah. And you look like you had something to say down there, sir. So take it away. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's, it's definitely there. And it's, it's, it's interesting because that, that idea, especially that kind of idea of, of heaven and earth, like that, that's very much an idea in the forefront of Eastern thought. Um, you know, most, most of how they talk about things is really in, in this idea of heaven and earth, but that is to be like the, the divine, the, the things that are above carnal, um, or material. Um, but understanding those concepts and how that plays its role in what each and every one of us does is, is, is important. Um, because I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we have to be doing something. Um, and of course that's kind of like what, what we're, I'm always exploring on, on, uh, saints and sages is, is what does that Christian way of life actually look like? What do we do? Um, because we can, we can do things that appear like they're godly but have no intent to be godly at all um and um you know we can even do things kind of slightly with, with a slightness to it you know that we mm. that are, you know in in a way secretly being malicious in what we're doing um <laughs> and um you know so so you know as you guys heard me mention before you know most of human behavior comes down or not just human behavior humanity comes down to two major aspects right that is our mentality how we think about things and then our behavior how does that manifest um we often want those two things to come and align with one another but they don't always do right um we can manifest being a just individual or or a good individual but not actually want to be there um you know it's the people that follow uh, or, <laughs> i heard it put this way brilliantly brilliantly um it's the shopping cart principle there are people that will actually go out of their way to go put back a shopping cart because they want to do what's right they want to you know make things better they want to you know not have to pull in and, or and and hit a, somebody's shopping cart as much as they don't want to leave one for someone else and then there's the others that just don't care as long as there's not a rule and there's you know if i'm not going to get paid for it which is what they used to do back in the day you used to get a quarter for uh, returning your shopping cart um you know um but you know there's there's a stark difference between individuals in the world so people behave very differently um in that regard um and of course um all of that um comes back to this idea of, of what what do we do not just what we do but why do we do it um you know it's it's funny that you brought up the shopping cart because that came up in conversation the other day with a a good friend of mine um <laughs> and uh you know so so he's jewish but he's he's um he's he's not practicing he's he's not he's he's agnostic i do plan on having him on on the show at some point for a discussion because he's hilarious and has a, a unique and awesome perspective on things but uh you know i i we got into a discussion about shopping carts um because i was telling him how matt walsh like one you know because he used to do this um he used to he used to return shopping carts that was his job right so so like you know if he were uh, a totalitarian dictator like that would be a legal mandate to return your shopping carts and and he said man that that would just be terrible like why would you take away the only actual metric for um, for ethics and morality that humanity currently has right <laughs> you know because yeah. he said you know you don't have to do it. it it's not going to benefit you anything to do it and and right. you know you genuinely don't have to so like if you return the shopping cart you're actually a good person. It's <laughs> yeah. a fair point. Yeah. And, 
and there's there's a point in that like you know there there are those that really so some people do it do so people fall into different categories in this regard right they'll do it because they're afraid of what other people are going to think about them um they'll do it because um uh because they think that it's the right thing to do and then of course there's others that will do it because they don't want to inconvenience others um and there's a sense in that like in, in what we're discussing here um as we have a responsibility of self right to, to be the, the best us who we can be who's god god has called us to be um and of course that is that is to mimic and, and chase after god um but that isn't to be um a standalone we also have a responsibility to others right which is why you have that love for god and right after that we've got love of neighbor love for the neighbor mm -hmm. but it also goes a step further than that and we don't have to crack that open yet but the implications <laughs> on that are to take it in a whole new mile right especially going back to that idea of justice <laughs> uh -huh. so <clears throat> Real quick, uh, and this, and we can we can talk about this because I'm sure people really want to crack this one open with us because we, we happen to be a Torah observant channel, so this is something that we, um, you know, it, it's it's obvious a topic. So it's so I want to I want to get everyone's thoughts on this. I'm I'm just going to read basically the the definition of uh, tikkun olam from a Jewish source. Okay. Jews believe that performing mitzvot, uh, which means good deeds, commandments, um, uh, religious obligations, is a means of tikkun olam, helping to perfect the world and that the performance of more mitzvot will hasten the coming of Messiah and the messianic age. Um, and this is at least, this is Talmudic. This is a Talmudic source. That's, it's, it's, that is a summary of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, by the way. So, um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I kind of want to get your guys's like, you know, because from our perspective, obviously that means you know you do more mitzvot, you you make the world it's... around you more holy. But what, you know, uh, go go you know go so, go nuts with that. <laughs> just it, it, fascinating, actually, that that was Shimon Bar Yochai, right? Because <laughs> you know when when you read through the Tanya, you you read about the five different kinds of men that there are, right? Uh, you have your two grades of tzaddik, uh, the the complete tzaddik, and the incomplete tzaddik. Um, person. Which, yeah, a, a tzaddik is a righteous one. <laughs> Stop um, using Hebrew. Not all of our audience can speak to an Hebrew guy. <laughs> so, so uh, I'm here for, for the education. So, <laughs> for 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 Robert, this is. The, I think you'll you'll love the definitions of these concepts, right? So, um, the idea of of a righteous one. Um, that's that's not a title that gets thrown around hap haphazardly in Jewish circles. And the idea of there being a complete and an incomplete righteous one, right? Um, it's it's pretty well understood that uh, most of the, the righteous ones in history that we know about were of the incomplete variety. Um, however, Shimon Bar Yochai, uh, who would have been a contemporary of probably the disciples of the disciples yeah if that makes sense second century um, yeah he when asked right about about you know the complete righteous one um what's written in the tanya anyway is is that he explains having met uh men who did everything that they did for the sake of heaven in such a way um, that it like it, it was just absolutely mind blowing how everything, everything they did, uh, every every thought that they thought, every action was strictly and only for the sake of heaven in in a way that is is unimaginable and could not be compared. And my brain is thinking, all right, well, who are these guys then? These these are nameless men. Right? Why? What? Why would these kind of men go nameless in history, especially, especially in Judaism? So I've got my own thoughts on who they might have been, <laughs> but yeah. no, no. And that... <laughs> you like what I did there? <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> that that's. <laughs> I must have missed it, but that 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 totally um, it, it's um is exactly who who i think we all want to be 
or at least right. we should want to be that. Um, and of course, I, I remember when I was first really getting into the theology, I, I started writing a paper on um, on this idea of change and how like there can actually be no change without conviction being a precursor. Right? You have to believe that something is wrong, something needs to be shifted, or that I need to move from here to there. Um, and in order for me to do that, like there, there has to be something that clicks, something that snaps. Um, but of course, you know, I spend more of my time trying to get people to take the the um, the law in principle first um, to, to say that, like, let's take these things and understand them be because we can we can perform these things. But again, if it's that doesn't necessarily that it's going to be in us, it's just what we present to everybody else. Um, and of course, where do we start with that? Of course, we start it, like if you want to be like these individuals, if you want to be centered on on the heavenly things, you have to uphold first and foremost the greatest of the commandments. Right. I mean, that only makes sense. And of course, it, once you have that into your mentality, once you can spend your time meditating on this idea, on this idea day and night, when you rise up and when you lie down, right, kind of thing that, that you can then that that will then begin to shape that mentality. And of course, that will hopefully manifest in your behavior. And where's your behavior going to be manifest most of all? Among your neighbors, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so I think that that's an, a very important aspect that we spend our time um, not, and this is why I always encourage people, um, people, people will say, oh, you know, I need to read my Bible today. You know, I need to do this, this routine. I was like, guys, you can do the routine for the sake of the routine. But like, it would be more beneficial if you actually just take the time out of your day and memorize a verse. And I, mm. and I can guarantee you, if you took that time to just memorize the verse, by the end of the week, you'll be able to do two verses. And by the end of the month, you'll be able to do about four. I think I got to a point where I was memorizing almost 18 verses in a single city. Um, but, you know, th that, that kind of pattern of behavior in return start shaping the mentality um, right. and so you know we have to understand these things interplay among one another um and uh and we can't just ignore one over the other um it's it's interesting you know you brought up the you know the 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 idea of of how we treat our neighbor and and how that manifests right um right. and and the fact that it really it's got to be a hard issue because like you said People can do things that are moral for immoral reasons, right? That that is an absolute truth, and it's it's interesting actually. The you know uh, one of the things that Tanya also points out about that is that you know if if you're doing the if you're doing the mitzvah for those kind of reasons, your reward is that you got the opportunity to do the mitzvah. That like yeah. that's that that's it. You got the opportunity to do a commandment. That's what you get for it, right? Yeah. There's no reward in heaven that you get for that. Oh, um, man. The, re the reward in heaven comes when you when you do it because you love God, right? Because yeah. there there's there is what what Seamus just put up earlier, right? There's kavana, there's intent, there's there's a passion behind it, and oh, yeah, yeah. when when this spills over into the love of a neighbor, it's funny. Uh, our I think our last show we actually we had another guest on, um, as a, a good friend of mine. He's studying to be a, a rabbi in uh, in Hasidic Judaism. And he brought to bear one of the most simple yet profound truths. Uh, and that's that this, this in many ways uh, takes root in, in one's marriage, right? If you are married, because yeah. your, your <laughs> wife is the closest neighbor that, that God has given you, right? She, she's the neighbor who sleeps next to you at night. Right. That's oh, no, 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 no. I would, I would even say that that is to love as you love thyself, as you love yourself. Right. Sorry. Go on. <laughs> no, no. That's your, your, that's, that's what I was getting at, man. Like you hit Sorry, the nail yeah. on the head. It's, <laughs> Jump you know, the gun. and, and so, so that's the idea though, right. Is the same, the same love with which you, you, you serve your spouse. Right. Cause right. you, you don't just, you don't, you don't just buy your wife flowers just because 
she wants yeah. you to right there's there is intent behind that there's kavana behind that there's passion behind that there's a yeah. you, you love her so you do these things for her you know not just because uh yeah okay this is what she likes so we'll do this right <laughs> yeah yeah um that's how we're supposed to approach our service uh to to god which as you've pointed out directly correlates to how we treat our fellow man right there you you can't really separate those two <laughs> yeah yeah and you know the the one of the things that um um I, i've seen that has been so much of a struggle for people in the church is that it is so easy to go out and do these these you know good works these works of evangelism and taking care of strangers um and at, you know you, you end up building these great ministries or or you know you 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 know fatten the homeless but at the end of the day so these people can lose their own children they can lose their own household um and that's because you know there's a point where like i don't have any real attachment to these individuals so um but that doesn't scare me what scares me is those that i actually have an attachment with and so mm. that becomes a, a difficult dynamic um you know to the people and then of course we've built things into that relationships and you know you can do all sorts of psychology and stuff you know but it's an important idea like as as um i believe it was max weber and, and take him for for who he was really but um who said that society breaks down to the smallest student and the, the very nucleus of society is the family this is where society really begins to form and of course if this becomes dysfunctional if this falls apart if this doesn't if this cannot be restored the whole of the world won't be restored um and, and, and that's that's something that, you know, looking at where do we start? Uh, this is where you start. Like, you got to get it right here. And of, of course, you, you look at the Shema, right? And, and, you know, these things you shall teach diligently to your neighbor. No, first and foremost, to your children, right? And to your children's children. Um, as if there is a specific role for grandparents. In this. Um, <laughs> but ab absolutely um yeah the 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 role of grandparents is I, I i think in many ways unappreciated until and until you know much later in adulthood i i know i certainly didn't appreciate the wisdom that my grandfather my late grandfather uh tried to offer me until i was i was much older in life um and, you know, of course, now that he's gone, I, I, I don't have access to that same wisdom anymore. And, and you know, it's it's like I miss it and I'm, I'm I'm jealous of my younger self, you know, when when I had the opportunity to just sit and, and, and talk <laughs> with him and, and ask him those questions and everything. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's definitely I, I think that that probably doesn't get enough attention even in Christianity. Like we're, there's oh, wow. there's a lot of attention put on on the, the impetus of a parent to teach their child. Um, but I th really, there isn't that much attention put on the role of a grandparent in also offering instruction yeah, yeah. to a grandchild. Yeah. And, you know, one, one of the things that people don't really understand is the way that the ancient world functioned um, within its own household. Like you didn't get married by a house, you know, across town. Like it was often an addition to the family complex. Um, and uh, um, the, you had this this common area where pretty much everybody lived, and then you had these apartments, and then you had special rooms that were dedicated to particular groups. But we don't need to get all, all that. Um, but this is how the family grew. It, it was often like the extended family, which is why when when people were married off, they actually left that family and went and moved into a, another family's home. Um, and, and of course, this is why that, you know, marriage was actually a bringing together of families, you know, like this is, this is, you know, pretty much your lives are now going to be intertwined with one another. Everything your family does and everything my family does, we're, we're pretty much going to be doing these um, in tandem with one another. Um, and so, so it was, it was a big deal. And of course, what is the role of the grandparent in all of this, you know, because at some point you reach a certain age, um, and you can't go out in the field anymore, right? I mean, you can clearly see this in the book of Ruth. Um, and I, I think that's probably an excellent place to go, right? Um, but you see this in the book of Ruth. Um, and uh, we have Ruth who is caring for 
her mother-in-law um, in part that she can't go out and really do this herself. Um, but of course, you also have the brilliant Boaz, right? Who 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 conducts himself within the parameters of, of being a steward, owning his property, owning his family's estate, and of course, that is, that's all throughout the book, right? And he he follows the law according to the not just according to the law, though, right? Because the the law says, "Don't wholly reap your fields." He doesn't just not wholly reap his fields. He says, "Guys, leave some extra." To reap, I want you to leave a little extra, and he was far generous than what he needed to be. And there's no indication that there was very many people that actually practiced this law over time. Um, but there, there's a few things that we see that we don't have good indications that people were actually practicing these certain things. One of those is the holy reaping of their fields. Um, the other is the uh, yearly Sabbath. Uh, mm. So, um, <laughs> but for the most part, like this is this is how an individual takes themselves, conducts themselves in a way that they feel that they have a role, they have a responsibility, not only within themselves but a care for one another. And let's face it, you can't, you cannot be living out any level of this, this idea of to play a part in this restoration of the world without love first being a primary thing in your mind, whether that's your love for God or whether that's your love for others. Like it has to be a, a natural, uh, um, almost a, a first cause, right? Right. Uh, it's, Funny you so you bring this up like the the that's the law of the payout by the way it means edges <clears throat> uh, and the Torah does say you're supposed to leave some on the sides but it doesn't say how much and so every person would leave whatever they thought was proper and so more generous men would usually leave more edge on their field and Boaz being a great example of a person um, who is living and and this is important this is, I, I brought Kavana back up again uh, but living with with uh, the Torah in uh, the, the law for, for the, not everyone's on board with the Hebrew um, in, in a way that is it, that it was always meant to be, it was always meant to be a document um, to show you how to love and then give you the freedom to express your love uh, whatever way that you would see fit. And um, the, the Tanya, this collection of uh, teachings on Jewish philosophy, it's a five volume set. It has this, phrase in it that i really really like because you were bringing it up earlier you know we can we can do the the ceremony all day right we can we can get up we can say the prayers um but kavana intent right the uh, the hebrew for kavana means like it's it's a really intense intent it's a very focused intent it it's it's the centrality of it the tanya basically says that if you have if you if you if you can yeah, let me reword it. You can do all of the commandments all you want. Yeah. And that's great. Um, cool. Good for you. You're not <laughs> special. Uh, be, if you're doing the commandments, all of them even, but you are, your motivation isn't there, your kavana, your heart is not in the commandment, you're not doing it out of the pure motivation of love for either your, your uh, fellow man, your neighbor, or for God, depending on the commandment, then it's as though you've not done a single thing at all. So you're better off not doing it. If your heart's not in it, who cares? You're, it's, you're yeah. honestly better off not even doing it. So yeah. it's super important. This idea of tikkun olam uh, is not just, oh, I'm you know doing my thing. If the intent isn't there, this, there, the spirituality doesn't manifest itself physically, if that makes sense. There's right. that crossover. It's, yeah it's interesting because you know it, it it ultimately you know what we're what we're all three in agreement here on is 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 that it's an issue of the heart and and where where the word finds its place in your heart right because so when even even when moses is is telling the children of israel and seamus you'll remember this from tanya too right yeah. and he's, he's he's given the torah to the children of israel and he says this commandment is not far away from you Right. It's not across the sea so that you say who, you know, who will go across and get it. Right. It's 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 not in heaven. So you will say who will ascend and get it. Which is interesting that Paul actually juxtaposes Jesus for the Torah uh, in Romans when he when he's quoting this. Mm -hmm. um, but what what does Moses uh, finish with? He says the, the this word is very near to you 
and the or the order that he puts this in is the most important, right? This word is very near to you in your mouth, right? Because at the very least, it's easy enough to say, right? In your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. Because the idea is that it's supposed to take root in the heart before before it blossoms into action, right? right. Because if, if it's just action without without coming from the heart first, it is worthless. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, yeah, of course. And, and, you know, take it home, like literally take this to your home and and ask yourselves how many of you with your spouses would be able to go through the motions of buying the flower to say that you're sorry, but not actually be sorry. Right. Like, what is that? That that is a completely empty action. You know, Um, this is why God says, like, you know, I I, I don't want your sacrifices. I want your heart. the idea here is like if if this is the whole of who we are this is what we have this is who we are and therefore this is what we have to offer to god and everybody else and and of course we want this to be the best that it can um now the torah is excellent for outlining ways in which we can do these things right um one of the things that you know i so many debates going on on this idea of, of Torah and Torah observance. And, and I'm like, guys, can you just like think for a moment here? Like the, the idea, there, there's also another idea here in, in the word Torah, as far as I understand, um, that is to guide. That is to say that, that you take these things and this is this is the pathway in which you should go. This is This is where you should go. And if you go this way, it's not going to take you to those heavenly things it, it's not going to lead into that restoration of the world if you go the opposite way of this it is going to lead into destruction and so therefore like do you want to partake in this or do you want to go down this road um a clear example of this i think is in the prophets right you see the adulterous woman um now people far too often like to take this thing and just make it black and white look there's, there's going to be this girl in society and you need to just watch out for it. it's like no 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 you have to understand like the the amount of steps that have to be taken in order to involve yourself with such a woman is not like a uh, oops i'm sorry I, I didn't mean to you know fall into sex with you um <laughs> <laughs> right the, you know there is a deliberate amount of decisions that are being made here and the caution for people to become wise individuals is to recognize not the end act, but all of those steps before you're even there. That's what you should be cautioned against. Um, and of course, you know, at the sense of this idea of tikkun olam, this idea of the restoration of the world, we have to also understand that there's a whole opposite side. There is the destruction of the world. Um, and and we have to choose because at the end of the day, we can't just say, you know what, I'm going to I'm gonna just stand right here because even the stand right here is really just to fall backwards you know um try to make it a banner sorry <clears throat> um so we're, we're we're at 10 till the hour it's usually around about this time we like to open up for questions from the comment section um and we uh, through that man <laughs> since we have a guest uh the, the comments might be geared towards you we'll see uh um, yeah, yeah. but uh in the meantime while we wait for some questions to pop up, um, uh, let's do this. I, I, cause I, I want to try, I want to try something. Um, cause everyone's going to have like this different perspective and I kind of want to hear it. Uh, yeah. so if you had to summarize it in a, in a very neat bow, put a bow on it, wrap it up kind of way. Um, what is tikkun olam? Like what is the essence? What is, what does it mean? Um, you, what's what is the best way that you could put it in like five sentences or less i give you guys a little bit of time to think about it yeah but, yeah uh, yeah we'll go around the room um i feel like brad isn't prepared never mind <laughs> so I'll, I'll actually start so i can give you guys some time um yeah, yeah. but um so for me uh it's it's a duty and, and that's a very very oversimplification but um Tikkun Olam is is your duty uh, to me. It's it's that is what you are called to do. That's the purpose for your your individual obedience, whatever that looks like. 
at whatever stage in life that you are and whatever capacity that you have capacity. That was weird. I, <laughs> I became Mark Wahlberg there for a second. Um, <laughs> in military terms, you'd say like, it's your MOS. I, I like that. Yeah. It's it. Yeah. It's your designator. Everyone has a place in this world. Everyone's been placed where they are for a purpose. And it's your duty to figure what, out what that purpose is in a way that, you know, is there, there are universal things, but, it's it's your duty to find your purpose and everyone's purpose is different and and that's kind of that's how i would summarize it but i want to hear your uh opinions from proper uh proper philosophers because i'm not one (laughs) (laughs) i i think for me you know takun olam if i were if i were to summarize uh if if i were to summarize that um and you know mind you that this is this is in like the 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 purest you know, most unadulterated form that I can think of, which is a difficult thing to achieve. Um, but it's to have the the wherewithal, uh, the the constant uh, wherewithal and self awareness to ask yourself, who am I going to be right now? Right? What 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 am I going to do? What what actions? What actions am I going to do to reflect my love for God here and now? Right. It's 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 to constantly be asking that because you're you're never in a state of not being right. You're you're always you're, you're right. You're, you're you're never in a state of not being. And so that has to be the question that's at the forefront of your mind always. And that is, you know, what a task, because <laughs> some of us don't think that even once a day. Um so so to have the wherewithal to think that constantly to think okay you know what what can i do uh to be a a better person so that your experience with me is a more positive one and 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 um allows you to experience the love of god through an interaction with me to, to constantly be asking myself how i can achieve that uh that's man that that's quite a task yeah all right man take it away i think that um you know, it's interesting that you asked that because I've, I've like that's pretty much like what I've been mulling over in my mind and trying to articulate um, for years now. Um, but but I would say that um, um, for however cliche it may sound, it is to be Christian. But I mean, there's an aspect of that that we we just completely miss because it's such a christianese term in itself but like that <laughs> idea of you know it's it's latinized of, of that idea of messianic right like, like to follow after or to even behave like the messiah would right i mean that that is ultimately the role of what the messiah does is that restoration of the world um we are waiting for that time in which god is going to actually literally turn over this world and restore it to its to its in original intended glory. Um, and yet we don't have to wait for an end time for that. We don't have to be by- bystanders in this. We don't have to be waiting for a, a rapture. Um, the, the idea is, is that we, we, can, we can be that now, which is often why Jesus teaches the kingdom of heaven is like. It's because we can do this now. Um, and th- that overarching principle of, of what it is to, to be like the Messiah, I think is summed up in that to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and mm. understanding what the kingdom of God is, understanding what righteousness looks like, like, like we can do that now in, in all that we have and all that we do and in, in, in how we live and we move and we breathe and we have our being, right? I, I mean, that I think is to chase after this idea of tikkun olam so <clears throat> that best one best one so far <laughs> yeah yeah i got i got i gotta Sorry, give it that one for sure. talking, so. nailed it <laughs> <laughs> let's see we got a couple of questions um so, and this is actually a really good one what have you found to be the greatest obstacle in serving god from a heart of love it's actually uh-uh. a, that's actually a good question like yeah uh, it's uh, just yeah. big enough. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, I think it's I, pretty, I, I don't want to. But a cowardly. Right. I, I don't, I, I don't want to. I got things that I like to do. 
Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's what makes it the hardest. <laughs> the hardest thing about chasing God with my heart is my heart. Like it's just it's just just not there yet. Like, and I recognize that. I recognize my my follies. Um, it's interesting. We've talked a lot. I think I've talked to both of you separately on occasions. We both brought up this idea of the different souls, but that kind of carnal soul. Um, <clears throat> there's a point in which, like, I, I think we have to um, become aware of this idea that this this part of us that really is a part of us, and be okay with that. Um, being natural right that, that is to be appropriate right the problem is when that thing when, when all of that stuff is takes things and makes things perverted to, to pervert things and that is really the essence of sin um but um there's that in me i recognize that i, I mean whatever it may be to, to get angry to um to want to wanna lash out to be wrathful rather than to to be quick to listen um um whatever it may be um uh, all different aspects the, the heart's just not there yet and yet though i want it to be right um there i still think that there is something um beautiful in that chase though, right the pursuit you're, you're taking yeah. the words right out of my mouth <laughs> <laughs> the, well, go on you can you can finish no no it's um the the, the idea yeah. is uh and this is actually a tanya concept as well um that let's say you you're you're not there yet like your heart's just not there you you, you and, and this is true of a lot of people you know I, I i just you know i love my car i don't i don't love god like i love my car i love my car <laughs> um <laughs> but if you want to love god that is intent and that counts as kavana so that's still something in which you can work on it because you want to want it and you don't necessarily feel it yet, but that, that's that's a sort of you you work your way into it kind of slowly. And, and um, uh, Tanya talks about that. Yeah, it talks about the, the the credit that you do get for wanting to want it, even though you're not quite yeah. there yet. Like because well, it, ultimately, it's still wanting the right thing. Right. There's this there's there's this idea that you know I I, I would tell my students over the years I would say that you know. It's not unusual to hear people say, hey, nobody's perfect. And I was like, but why are we okay with that? Like, the, the fact that nobody's perfect doesn't mean that we should all just not be perfect. Like, we should be discontented in the fact that we're imperfect. So, um, and, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we have to recognize that, that there's something not in us yet. And we should want more. Like every now and again, I just get that itch in life, you know, that I want something more. Like I want to be better. Like I want to go do out and do do great things, um, not for my own sake, but because they're great things, you know. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I, I find that to be the pleasure in pursuing um, pursuing God, pursuing Christianity. So, you know, we've got the shot. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't know if there's any more questions. I don't want to. No, I mean, keep, keep going. Uh, yeah. there's actually, that was probably the, there's one more, but keep going. Yeah. So we got the shop here. Um, and, and of course, you know, I kind of stepped out from ministry and stepped out kind of chasing this idea of, of ministry in the church, because I realized that that can only reach so far. What I really want is like, like I have a genuine, genuine care as I, I'm sure, you know, both of you guys know, I mean, Brad, Brad, we've had a little bit more conversation on this. But we have a genuine care for the individuals in our community. And we want to create a place for them to, to bring people in, not to just make money off of them, but to serve them something of good quality. And that good quality has to be accompanied with good hospitality. Like to me, that is what Christianity actually looks like. Um, and, and, and I am blown away and honored and blessed at every opportunity i get that then i'm like you know hey this is actually working to some degree like it, like it, it's it's good and it's pleasurable in the fact that it is that it is good so i have a i have a, I have a story it's a hasidic story and hasids yeah, yeah. love their stories story. um and i'll paraphrase it it's a short one but because I, I, I like like your 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 cidery uh, yeah we would like to do a cidery yes okay um but okay so the story goes like this as a man who owned a bakery um and um 
uh, another rich man. He, he wasn't doing super well. He, he you know, his business was kind of. He, he had a lot of overhead, and he was not breaking even all the time. So, rich man comes and says, "Here, I'll, I'll buy up your business, um, but uh, in return, you will study Torah on my behalf." So these are two Jews, uh, and so basically, he's saying, uh, you, "You'll do all the learning, and you'll teach me what you get taught. So you'll, and I'll run the business for you, and you go and do the learning, and then we'll meet in the middle." So. I'll pay yeah. for your livelihood and you can do the Torah study because I don't have the patience to learn or whatever. I would love that agreement. <laughs> so, and, and the, the old man who owns the bakery is like, okay, cool. Uh, a couple of weeks go by and he comes back and he's like, I quit. I'm not doing this. I can't do this. I can't do the study. And the, and the rich guy is like, what? what's the matter? And he goes, my business was going under, yes. But every time I made a lump of dough, I would say, God, let this dough be everything that it's capable of being. And then I would put the, I would shape the dough into the cookies or to the bakery. And I would, and I would say, you know, Hashem, let this be, please bless this bread. And then I would put it in the oven. God bless the fire. And, and he said, I, every, everything I was doing, I was talking to God. But when I went into the yeshiva, I stopped talking to God <laughs> and I, I missed that. And so I would rather be in a poor situation where I am one with Hashem than sitting there being a student. It's just not the life for me. Uh, yeah. And so the rich guy goes i hope the whole town is like you my friend <laughs> yeah yeah no no that's, that's totally totally where i am you know and um oh man there's so much that we have to talk about gentlemen <laughs> um, but but there's this idea of um we have we have a, a bad tendency in the church to talk about christianity in theory right um that we've become very well educated and in fact we have almost a, a, a line of scholars right this guy ends up in in the leadership position because his father was in that and his father was after that um and, and yet this is what they've done their whole life i mean it's the same problem we have with career politicians right y you guys actually haven't dug down in the dirt with me. you haven't actually like lived life you haven't like actually you know, um, you, you've lived in a bubble for the most part, which is like what we were saying before we started. But, you know, the worst thing that could happen for us is to grow up in an echo chamber, which is why diversity, why I I thoroughly love and enjoy having both of you guys um, um, in, in dialogue with me. So. so we got the most important question of the night. Is Robert coming to the after part? As... Yeah, yeah. I'll be washing dishes mostly, but yeah, I'll be there. Awesome. And uh, we had one other question. Um, it's a little off topic. I think we can knock it out. We'll call this one. Uh, we'll call it a day for the here, and then we'll head on yeah. to the uh, after part. As um, so, uh, how would y'all explain to someone that is accusing somebody of being self righteous when he is just trying to have a lifestyle of holiness? Uh, this <laughs> is a, this is something me and Brad run into pretty often, actually. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I'd like your perspective on it. Well, um, if any of you guys are ready to go, I'm going to need some time to, to gather my thoughts on that. It, it's, it's a really important question and something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, on, I, w I would say on a personal level in my personal experience, and again, this is where the, the self-examination becomes very important, is to ask yourself, okay, well, am I, am I doing uh, because I want to be able to say that I'm holier than other people? Um, or am I truly just seeking a closeness with God? Uh, because that, that really ultimately should be the, the chief motivation. Um, if it's, if, if your, if your motivation is to achieve holiness, um, then, then this is, this is not correct. Um, but, and, and, and I will say that I have run into some, especially in, in the Torah observant community, um, and I, I would say more so on the Hebrew root side of it, that that seems to be the motivation. Um, typically, they come out of more charismatic backgrounds where their motivation for speaking in tongues was so that they had something, you know, something one up on you. And so when it came to Torah, this was just one one extra thing that they could hold over somebody else's head uh, because, you know, they were a more devout Christian. Um, but I, I would say, look, you know, if 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 this is not a valid accusation, right? If you're, if this is genuine, I wouldn't pay it any mind. Um, you know, I would say that's probably more conviction than anything. So to, uh, I'll, 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 mine is quick. I, Cause I'm kind of snarky with this stuff. I, I have no tolerance. 
uh, for people that have prejudged my motivations. So if somebody is accusing you of being self-righteous when you're trying to live a holy lifestyle, a lot of the times the, the insult is Pharisee. We get that a lot. Um, at this point, uh, you know, he, he doesn't know my motivations. He, do, he can't possibly know my mind. Uh, so this person is making a premature judgment on me. Usually it's people that don't know me that make this accusation. So I've stopped caring. And so now my answer is usually, you're right. <laughs> and then I just yeah. let it go. I just, you know what? Yeah. Sure. Whatever you think, man. It's, it, I, I just, I, I don't let it bother me anymore. Um, so <laughs> uh, according to the, uh, the way of the wise, um, there's this aspect in which like, you have to understand that we need to behave mostly like what's the common term we play with our cards close to our chest you know the, the idea is is that um we spend most of our life kind of in our in our closet right like when we pray um the the you can see the self-righteous because they parade themselves out on the uh, on the street corners um which is why like you, you'll never find me on TikTok, actually, I have given in a few times, but I, I really try not to like when people hop into a live and ask for some sort of prayer right then and there. Um, but like, I, I was just like, I'd rather not, I'd rather not make this a, a, a display of a prayer and piety. Um, so in that, like, make sure that you're playing with your cards close to your chest. Um, and, um, there was a second thing that I was going to follow up with, but I kind of lost it. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a primary thing that, that, that ought to guide us, right? Um, that is to, to not let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Um, and, and so you have to also recognize that there's going to be people that recognize what you're doing. But I would, I would then consider this possibility. Remember Jesus' parable when he talks about the day wages, right? When he goes out and he hires some people early in the day to come in and work. Um, and then he goes out later in the day and he hires them to work. And then he goes out late in the day and he hires those men waiting for work to come and work. But at the end of the day, he pays them all the same. And the guys that were working earlier in the day are really upset that they only got paid the same amount as the guys that came in late in the day and he says is it that i i mispaid you or is it the fact that my generosity shows that your you, reveals your wickedness um your spite um and i think that that's that's an important idea to understand that though we seek to live our lives in some sort of pious and holy way um, at, at the end of the day, there are some people that are going to spite that very fact. And you just need to be okay with it, um, which is pretty much what you guys said. So. No, it, it's it's like, I like that because you said at the beginning of the episode that you were right in the middle between the two of us. <laughs> and you've ended yeah. your last statement by being exactly the middle between the yeah. two of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. By no means, please don't take that as me being the lo lukewarm individual. <laughs> No, 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 no. We, uh, oh, we should do an episode on that lukewarm concept because that's Ooh. not what it, what people think it means. That's that's an episode for the day. I like that uh, idea, yeah. Austin. Put it in. Put it on the list. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll invite. We'll invite. Uh, we'll invite you back for that one. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm. I would love to be back. It, it's it's always a pleasure to talk with you, gentlemen. Yeah, and, and uh, <laughs> if you want next, because that topic is actually very historically focused. Um, so that might. Uh, give you a chance to monologue a bit more i'm not sure if you like that or not but <laughs> i i find it a terrible tendency so i i feel like i monologued enough in this one so um <laughs> I, I feel like you i mean personally i feel like you didn't get a chance to talk enough but that's me personally uh, really but okay that's, yeah. that's, that's, that, that's because i was monologuing too much so my apologies <laughs> <laughs> and have me back anytime you want back. i've got tons to say so <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so uh, we're going to go ahead and start the closeout process. So um, live well, live wisely. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, that's good. I'll give you the cue when to actually say that. Uh, but, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're good. You're good. That's, that's, I like that. It's good. Um, 
but uh, yeah, so we're about to head into the after part as, uh, let's see where I got it here. First things first, let our guest plug himself because he also has a ministry that he's trying to, he's trying to, to, to work with and, and, and get the word out there and, and teach people awesome things. So yeah. Robert, where can people find you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mainly find me on TikTok right now. Um, that's all I got time for in managing my crazy life. Um, but yeah, yeah. Saints and Sages, um, at, on, on TikTok. Um, and, uh, there's a lot to be said about that, but I probably won't, shouldn't take too long. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. Uh, in fact, actually, after the video ends, I'll put a link to all of your stuff in the description. Yeah, um, very much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, so anyone can go and click in and support. Um, okay, yeah. And so uh, the after part is, is um, we, we basically jump in the Discord for all of our Patreon supporters. If you, you're giving at any level, uh, it could be a dollar, it could be a hundred, doesn't matter. Um, you you can join us in the after part as you can hang out with us, you can sit in awkward silence with us, you can ask us any questions. It's so whatever you guys want to do. Usually, we do post show at uh, go into greater detail, ask questions. It's a good time. Um, just ask Bobby, it's a great time. <laughs> uh, and our Wait, link what? to the Discord is also in the description. Uh, a link to the Patreon is also in the description. So everything in, in, is in the description below if you want to get in on that, if you're not already in on that. Um, feel free to hit <laughs> Bobby's uh, smiling already. <laughs> oh, we got another Bobby. See, see, I grew up with Bobby. I was like, wait, what, what's this reference here? So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's our meme lord. <laughs> yep, yep, Bobby K. <laughs> so uh, that's basically it for us, I think. So, um, in fact, let me let me let me get the credits ready. Um, but, sir, if you would do the honors of your signature sign off, yeah, let you have the last words. Take it away. Yeah. Anyways, uh, yeah, check me out. Saints and Sages, it comes from this idea of um, a, a really a, an Eastern proverb, but that is the way of the Saints and Sages is not mastered in a signal evening. And I believe that that is entirely where we are all in Christianity. It is not mastered in a signal evening. But anyways, with that, I hope to see you all elsewhere. Live well, live wisely. Sola Deo Gloria. Mm -hmm.